Where am I? So, oh, yeah, finally got it to work. There you go. Hi, how are you doing? Good. I don't want to brag. It's like 80 degrees here, and <laughs> I've, I've been out building a garden for the past week, and then I, I guess my immune system was down a little bit, so I got a bit of a cough, so I'm taking the day off. So. Oh, okay. Well, that's too bad. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Are you on a swing set, or what are you doing out here? <laughs> so, <laughs> making it, sorry, there making you go it, around. So Oh, very go round. Okay, no, it's, it's, it's kind of a lanai slash. They call it a Florida room, but oh, you can right. Say I got some plants growing out there. Just built some little raised beds for myself and uh, that's nice. The apartment that we're living in here. So yeah, yeah. And if you could put your phone horizontal, then we get a better picture. It fills the screen. Yeah, yeah. there we go. That's nice. Okay. Um, and then I, you get, yeah, if you could set it down or put it somewhere. I'm just saying, it helps. Cindy is. Cindy's good. If you want to tip your screen up a little bit, Cindy, then it won't chop off the top of your head. Oh, chop off the top of my head, huh? Yeah, I don't want to do that. So this is real? Is this real or this is... Uh... We're recording and we're doing it for real, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I didn't prepare for real. Oh yeah. Well, that's good because then we'll catch you in all of your... in Your, your first answers are always the answer to go with, right? Let me tell you what. Don't think about it too hard. Well, yeah, that's the problem. Mm-hmm. Talking for all of Alaska is kind of hard. <laughs> oh, Jeremy will do that. We'll let the lead. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, kind of funny because the, one of the main uh, things that I see standing in our way is our rugged individualistic ideals. And everybody, you know, it's way back in the pioneer days, people started moving westward for their personal pursuits of happiness and property and uh, living off the land and that continued right up into Alaska. So we're just now kind of all pulling back together and mm -hmm. forming these communities roughly in order to get things done more efficiently. So, yeah. When the resources are there and the services are there that you're able to do that, which is kind of funny to say that there has to be a certain condition where you can be independent. And then right. all of a sudden something changed and you can't be independent. Well, I thought that the whole point of being independent, you know, right. Yeah. Well, I I just want to add to that that ha and I'm speaking for Jeremiah. I know that half of his ancestors originally were from here, and uh, they already had the the setups that we need to build community and to hang together. It's just the Western civilization came in, and that's what's really um, screwed everything up. Yeah, that does bring up a good point. Um, so one of the first uh, quote unquote white people in Alaska. Uh, his name was um, William Clark, and apparently, three generations back before my great grandfather, his grandfather, um, it was like 1850s, they came over uh, with the telegraph union to put some sort of communications cable in, uh, proposing to go across Russia to Europe. Wow. And um, at this point, there was only native cultures and living in village societies at the time. And they decided the project wasn't feasible and ended up pulling out. Well, my great grandfather's grandfather stayed and in order, order for him to survive, he had to basically marry into those villages. And yeah. he he survived off the land, caribou and um, salmon were the main uh, staples back then. And it was a tough life. Um, but it was, it was, you know, later on when we started bringing in infrastructure to make things easier that we started seeing a lot of development, but also at the same time, uh, uh, straying away from those cultural um, institutions that have been in place for thousands of years that gave them that, years, yeah. yeah, that gave them that connection to the land and that respect that ultimately is, is uh, crucial in feeling as you grow older, um, protecting and being a foster of the land itself. So when the snow goes came in, out went the dog sleds, you could go for miles and miles and miles, but you needed gasoline. So then we're getting into this whole petroleum age where, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're dependent on it. And if it, the, if it goes away, then it, it's a steeper learning curve to go back to the dog sleds and, and walking and surviving and living off the land. So exactly. we're so close. And that's why Alaska is special. We're so close to that age. It was like yesteryear. And there's still people alive that lived that and well, have that when, experience. So When I was in ninth grade, I went to spend a summer in the village. And there was one landline for the whole village. And yeah. now 
that was 1974, I think, the summer I was up there. And now the, high, the oil companies um, give free cable TV to everybody in the villages. So it's a whole, everybody has cell phones. I mean, that, that's just in my lifetime that has happened, that the pipeline came through and has now um, just changed sure. all of Alaska. <laughs> right. Right. So that with, with, with bringing in the snowmobiles, the trap lines got farther, but then you had to get yeah. more things in order to pay for the gas and the right. suits and the machine. And so yeah. now you had to basically hunt and, and trap a lot more in order, mm -hmm. but you raise, you raise your right. lifestyle at the prop, you know, with that. But of course you also are extending farther out into the wilderness. And then there's more people extending farther out into the yep. wilderness. Right. At the same and, now time. With, and now with climate change, those things aren't so easily accessible, even with oil. The ice is changing. Um, right now, Kurt was just up, my husband was just up north and they're hardly making it to the leads in the ice because the ice is so, so thin that um, people are breaking through and they're, they might not even get whales. And whales are the one thing that's um, important, uh, like our salmon is in the rest of the state, but up there, whales are the most important they now have to import their freezers because all the ice caverns are gone. They've oh, all melted wow. out. And a lot of people are coming to Anchorage. And I think that's one of Anchorage's biggest problems is that we're getting all the influx, the climate change refugees from the villages who can't subsist anymore. When the oil is too expensive, the gas is too expensive, they can't, um, different economies are changing. Um, but also the berries are moving up the mountain. It's harder to get to the, there's yep. not any ice for the seals to sit on. So the seals don't come to shore. Um, polar bears are, are starving. I mean, it's my, fr my friend, Marianne, she went out and, uh, put old freezer burned walrus meat out on the tundra just to feed the polar bears. <laughs> oh, wow. Terrible. Yeah. Anyway, so Anchorage's problem is the we can't even feed ourselves. Right. Yeah. Right. All sorts of refugees coming in. Yep. And so, Anchorage represents the hub of civilization in Alaska, but the rest of the state, you know, they have a much tighter uh, connection to those species that are hinged on such a fragile uh, existence in the ecosystems in place and so they're the ones that are the most effective but at, at the same time they represent a, a small population of Alaska um, so while we have this great change and these huge impacts at the same time uh, civilization itself you know people are going into Anchorage because we have all the infrastructure there at the same time it's like a two-edged sword you know so I can see Alaska and in We've talked about circumpolar issues in health. We also need to talk about it in ecosystems, climate change, and those are the greatest effective areas, affected areas where a lot of those indigenous cultures are still so connected on those eco ecosystems and, and mm -hmm. the sustenance, subsistence um, that they provide. There's not so, very many, at least in Alaska, villages on the North Slope anyway that are connected anymore. Yeah. It's, uh, oil money has definitely changed everything. Yeah. They're, they're spending their winters in Hawaii. There's it's just America, USA, anywhere, you know, if you go in there. Of course, a seal here and fish drying here, but it's more like um, my family who traditionally hunted moose every, every fall on the river, but we just do it once. We're not really a subsistence. We still go to the grocery store. So it's just changing more into something like that. But yeah. um, Right, I, right. A collapse is, is coming shortly if it continues to warm. What's happening is then the permafrost is all melting and that's emitting uh, uh, the, um, what's it called? Mm -hmm. Methane, exactly, which is so much more uh, dangerous than uh, the CO2. So we're creating our own negative feedback loop and we don't know how to get out of it. So right. that's, that's a real problem. Yeah, I, there's uh, this paper that I've been sending around to people uh, <laughs> about climate adaptation and, and, and how to avoid a climate tragedy. It's very well written and it basically is all the science that nobody's telling you. Um, yeah. Because this, even the scientists are pulling back because they're not trusting their own numbers because they're so bad. And they also don't want to have the chicken little syndrome. They don't want to lose their jobs. 
And because they don't have any real, like they would say, corroborating evidence, they kind of pull back a little bit. And so the extreme nature that we're probably going to be in is known. It's just that nobody wants to go there because- They're yeah. gonna, I, I got that. For, I was trying to search for facts. And I wrote to one of our senators in Juneau and to a newspaper guy that knows a lot of, Steve Heimel, he knows a lot of everything. And he's saying he can't get anybody, both of them said they can't get anybody to put anything down on paper because of that very thing. They'll get fired. Yep. They'll get, you know, so, so things are, it's just, you know, you don't right. know where it's, to start. It's yeah. repeating. Basically, if you look back through history, uh, empires rise and fall, cultures, I mean, they come and go. And a lot of it is a short-sightedness and our inability to learn from the past. Um, and the way I see it is there is a positive that could come of this. And that is just like it took innovation to move north over the past several millennia for humans to exist in colder and colder climates. Well, as those resources are harder to get and we're withdrawing back into the equatorial zones where the energy is more abundant, we're going to start in, uh, innovating, improvising at levels we've never even seen before due to necessity. Right now, we're not feeling the, the strain so much. In Alaska, we're up there. We're still, we've got money to work with. We've got jobs. But, you know, when the economy start crashing harder, that's when we're going to see some real progress and people really starting to pay attention on how uh, they're developing these energies and where they're investing their future dollars because, you know, oil is by far the most profitable um, exploit uh, in existence right now. So they're the ones that are going to be able to look back on everything they've done and, and see that, you know, hey, this investment is, is crucial to our future. And I, I was reading PR releases by Shell and BP and all these companies, and they're really trying to not pull the wool over people's eyes, but they're trying to spin it. In, and they're saying, they're starting to say things like, uh, developed nations will start having to reduce their expectations and quality of life. And they're not really getting to the chase. But if you read their PR and, you know, their publications, you can see that there are certain aspects of their research that are starting to get more into the renewable energies. And I'm not like saying, hey, these guys are going to be the saviors of the world. But right now, they're the ones with the means to develop right. these new types of energies that are going to be so um, critical, you know, in the next couple of 50 years, even, you know, so. Yeah, the innovation is going to come from the startups and right. then the bigger companies, if they want to invest in that, buy it out, whatever it is. Exactly. But it's, but it's tough also for them, too, because it's driven by the, the MBAs, the quarterly reports and yep. investment, investment and, yeah. uh, you know, unions and, and retirement money and things like that. It's really tough to steer that boat to a different direction if people aren't motivated. Until crisis starts becoming commonplace, people are not going to, you know, once you get past 19, 20, you don't really learn anything unless it's an emotional connection. And it's like, oh, that's why, you know, I made a mistake. Now I really feel like I have to do something different. That's how you reach the adults. Otherwise, if you're just trying to educate people, you have to start with the kids and work your way up. Right. You know, the rest of us are just going to have to learn the hard way. And that's, mm -hmm. that's to me, that's, that's my perspective. That might be the, not be the absolute truth, but that's how I see it. When it comes to reaching people, I can lead by example, but I can't go out and say, hey, you need to do this or, or tell them what they should be doing. Um, they're going to have to learn it their, the hard way. Right, right. Everybody is a, as a cultural change as a group, as a society. Sure. Well, let me, let me start getting into our, my, my questions here. This is a really great start, yeah. <laughs> and I appreciate it. Um, so we've already kind of talked about this quite a bit. Um, but our first question was about trends in, in climate. And you guys have been up there long enough, decades, to, to see this, and even having family that's been up there. Um, so when would you say was your earliest inkling or the first time you heard about possible changes in climate? And then was there a time when people started noticing these trend change, changes? Do you want to go first, Cindy? Sure. Um, I want to say that... Um, the first year that it didn't get below 40 below, people were so anxious. They were like, it's going to come. When's it going to come? And the whole, everybody was just so tense because it wasn't happening. And uh, th that was the first time that I started doing some investigation. Of course, 
1981, when we took our honeymoon through the state, we looked at all the glaciers and um, then, you know, you go back 10 years later and they're, they're not there anymore. You can't even, you have to take a boat to them. That's a, another thing. And it, of course you could say, well, that's just a, a trend, you know, it's just happening. But um, now with uh, the different, it, it, now it's just, everybody knows that there's climate change in Alaska. Everybody. I, I don't think anybody could even say that there's not a change. It's just that they're still arguing whether people are doing it or not. And uh, we're s the number one um, per capita, the number one producer of CO2 in the, the state of Alaska is, and that's due to our oil industry. If it weren't for oil, we wouldn't be number one, but we're still number one. We're producing the CO2, we're putting it in the air, and we're very dependent on that oil money. So um, it's been gradual for me, but um, the last maybe three or four years has been tragic. Right, right. How about you, Jeremy? Well, it's kind of hard to uh, say, you know, when, what day, year, whatever. In Alaska, we're still, you know, covered a lot by ice. And we know as a fact, we came out of an ice age 10,000 years ago. And during that time, the Bering Sea land bridge was all covered in ice. So we may have already been seeing uh, dramatic changes in our northern hemisphere during the past couple of thousand years anyway. But for me as a personal uh, practice and study and realization, as uh, 2004, when I first got to university, I was taking a, a uh, level, it was 101 geology, geography mix. And one of my labs was to do a 50 year trend analysis for the, just the Anchorage area temperatures. And this is back when everybody, well not everybody, but a lot of people are still saying climate change was kind of a hoax and this and that, especially conservatives in my family. There's a lot of conservatives in Alaska. And, and about what Cindy was saying, there's hardly anybody that will refute the evidence now, but there are still people that are all so far out there that, you know, they may be listening to just one news station that still uh, says it's a hoax mm -hmm. and there are, they're still voting and they still have a say in our uh, local elections and, and policy. But that was 2004. I found there was a three degree change just in the past 50 years. And so I started thinking about that and that's in Alaska. Um, and over throughout my childhood, I had seen snow kind of dwindle. Um, but again, I was just kind of attributing that to just fluctuations in the, mm -hmm. in the general trending coming out of an ice age. But after doing that three uh, or 50 year study and finding those three degrees of declination in annual trending, I saw that there was some other like variables that uh, led me to do a little bit more research and start looking at, you know, what was going on worldwide. And that's when you really start to see what's going on. Um, you, it's really hard to just stay in one place and, and put it all together. So like, as far as recommending to people that, that refute it, you know, look at opposing research studies and figure out, you know, where they're out of alignment, but you know, you'll, you'll find little commonalities that say, okay, maybe we can't, truly say that there's a, a cause and effect relationship, but what we can say there's, you know, uh, some correlation between the amount of methane or the heat and the general population increase, the industrialization, and the amount of methane, CO2, greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere. Those correlations are irrefutable if you, you know, look at just the graphs alone. Right. Um, so, um, what was the second part of the question? I guess that was just my realization. Oh, was it was just, yeah, it was just more or less the, uh, the trend uh, in your region and where things you think are, are going, but also where you might predict they're going in the future, say the next 10 to 20 years, knowing that, you know, what we see seen going forward and also that things seem to be accelerating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I would say that, like, from what I've read and going through both social and historical um, publications in school and after school people that I've talked to that the real the problem with the climate changes is you know food supply 
and it's so directly uh, related. Our ability to produce, produce food is so directly related to having those ideal temperatures. And now it's you know, getting more and more hectic in areas where traditionally we've had enough water southwest of the United States. Their water table is severely depleted right now. And um, most of, a lot of it's contaminated that, that's uh, still at the ground surface level being used as irrigation for crops. And you know, that's just going to continue to increase or decrease and the amount of arable land that we're, we're able to support. I think it's, we're at one and a half times capacity right now of the earth's, you know, ability to, to produce. So as we see more and more fluctuations in those temperatures, our crops are more vol volatile mm -hmm. and that's where it's going to hit us the hardest, even though we can withstand the temperatures or survive the hurricanes and tornadoes and, and what we may be seeing by migrating you know, we have to look a little bit more at, um, and this is a personal beef I have with a lot of people that complain about where they're at. It's like, get up and move. You know, you can't sit down in a place and not truly assess whether or not it's going to be a good, good fit for you based on the energy, based on uh, location to your work. Why, why commute three hours to work each way? You know, that's just absurd and complain about it and go start something else or do something else. Um, all of those people that are so hard set and living in a certain place based on their comfort of, of and lifestyle are going to be the most um, awakened, you know, when we start uh, falling short of food supply, especially in Alaska. Prime example, one barge goes down the next day, people are all at the store shopping and the, the shelves are empty. It's just like Russia, you know, in the fall of Soviet or USSR. Mm -hmm. um, bread lines, gas lines in the 70s, those things are are not commonplace, but they do happen. And people just don't expect it because they think, you know, they're working a nine to five in a stable atmosphere, city and routine that it's not right. going to be interrupted when in fact, I mean, it's completely interruptible and very susceptible to all these very you know, fragile systems. things that are, yeah, exactly. So you just, and that's the, the other good thing, a uh, positive thing that I would take out of the, you know, ensuing turmoil is that, not only is there going to be innovation, but when we start enduring changes and, and hardships, it, it uh, strengthens you as a person, as an individual. And that's what I've, I've kind of focused on is just strengthening, strengthening my own uh, existence and starting home base. You know, do I have a garden? Am I maintaining like a low carbon in, uh, footprint? Is my lifestyle interruptible? And I look at all the weaknesses, you know, where am I getting my food from? Is that susceptible? You know, am I importing it? Am I staying within season? Um, am I growing at home? Am I not commuting three hours to work using a bunch of gas that's going to go skyrocket and that job won't be economically feasible down the road? And so mm -hmm. personal hardships, I'm actually enduring on purpose in a way living in a small cabin, working right. on my property, not commuting and telecommuting is great, but you know, the internet is also not foolproof and working online isn't always going to be an option. And if it is, then when it, when people are forced to go to working online, then everybody's going to want to do it. The competition is going to be fierce and then you're going to make a lot less. So the economics of it are for me, uh, self, uh, uh, reliance and independence but at the same time appreciation of community in a place like alaska especially so i'm down here in a subtropical growing um you know all kinds of plants in the winter time studying the availability uh but you know there's all all kinds of problems in this kind of situation because i'm contemplating getting a sailboat having you know bug out vehicle and um, place to go with food forests already um, sure. in place farms in Central America that I establish relations with that I could go sail to and exist when you know if things ever got or to retire you know who knows things might end up better but um, the availability in the these zones of, of uh, plenty are, are are enormous but at the same time there's also lots of pests, lots of competition, people packed in like sardines. I, and this is where people, you know, the guy next to you is as good as dead if you try stealing your loaf of bread. You know, it's, it's not that extreme, but, you know, cutting people off on the highway, there's all kinds of road rage and you can just see it like people are 
waiting to explode on each other yeah, for any little not, reason down here. It's not that's, that bad in Alaska yet. <laughs> it's not really like you really appreciate uh, yeah. the vast open space, wide open spaces, so to speak, when you right. come down to these more uh, densely populated places. Yeah. And I'm I'm just doing it for research and mm -hmm. for you know enjoyment. And uh, you know I'm here with Rachel, who is a caretaker that came up to um, help me. Um, get ahead in Alaska when I was struggling and it really worked out between us so I came down here to help you know support her uh, while she's going to school and and um, cool. I'm really enjoying this education because I don't like you know the area the mentality the the, the availability of produce is great um, but I can see you know and appreciate the benefits that we have in Alaska that, right. that they don't the problems that they don't um, have up there that they do have down here well, our next make, question make was going to be about, you know, what adaptation there would be. But like I say about permaculture in general, we do by choice that may someday be a necessity. So right. we're very practiced in things that then if it ever did come to be a necessity, it's like, oh, well, I've been doing that anyway. So I'm just going to crank that up a few more degrees, you know, and do it that much better, uh, which I doesn't think, make. Go ahead. I think what Jeremiah said about food is exactly the, the problem with the future. We just don't have. We're importing 95% of our food right now in Alaska. That means 5% is our fishing and our hunting, and that's not that much. Our emergency storage food is stored in Oregon. So if there's an earthquake or something big, we don't have <laughs> food. And people, um, there's three days of food on the, on the grocery store um, shelves, which Jeremy kind of said. So we don't have food. We're very, very vulnerable here. And Not only that, but it's illegal to, I mean, they don't enforce it. But, you know, if you read the regulations, it's illegal to stockpile food well, in many I, places. And in Alaska yeah. is one of them. Well, and it's not enforceable because, I mean, no. you have to store for earthquake and all that. But well, you can say um, you're Mormon. <laughs> what's that? You can say, say you're Mormon. Mormon and that's a religious thing. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, there's all kinds of ways around it, but. You know, it's just funny that there's laws like that in place that what I wanted you know, to prohibit. Say, what I wanted to say is that the in the future, we're already very vulnerable. And one of the ladies at the Permaculture Guild say, says that salmon fry are getting cooked in the river, basically. They just can't find their way back because of the warming temperatures. When I went to hear Obama's uh, research people talk, they said the next fish that we're going to have in the in the cup a river isn't salmon it's jack skip jack tuna and that we need to be starting to figure out how we're going to change our habitat i mean our our eating so that we can uh, adjust to different food supply i can't imagine tuna coming up here but salmon they're thinking is is out the window and they mm. now salmon are even coming on the north slope now which is amazing because they're just moving north but um our the food supply water is huge 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 issue since we're so dependent everybody f catches fish here everybody um trades things around and even in the cities so uh well, are you having a better will you say that is there any not that it's an upside at all and i was just talking to somebody from canada the other day and canada has already decided they're going to hit be hit worse faster their you know their temperatures are rising faster than anywhere else because of latitude, generally speaking. Right. But of course, Alaska is right up there too. Yeah. It's not part of the Canadian area. But uh, it's the same, yeah. So, but is, uh, are you going to be able to grow food with a longer growing season or is that just irrelevant in all of this? Um, yeah, the, right now people are planting now and it's, that's just unheard of. And so of course we can plant now, um, more and more people are planting fruit trees that we couldn't have before different things are coming in, but, but I don't think we've hit the tipping point that Jeremiah was alluding to in that there's a crisis coming. And so people that are gardening are doing it just for fun. They're going to the farmer's markets for fun, but everybody is still going to Safeway to shop. And they're still mm -hmm. not realizing that at any time that could be gone. And, and we had an earthquake this last fall. <laughs> People didn't even have flashlights. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they just were not prepared. And, and so I thought maybe that earthquake would help the situation. It really hasn't. 
we're still in denial as a whole. So do you think it's a matter of, of government policy or regional policy or something that needs to uh, increase the possibility of change so to avoid a tragedy or is there anything that can be done to avoid a crisis or a tragedy that's coming up? The Permaculture Guild, I, I polled them. There's probably about <clears throat> oh, 15 people there and they said there's nothing that we can do. We just have to remain positive. But on the other hand, just in case, we're all, of course, putting in food for us as fast as we can. We, uh, although the city is, we're having problems with the city if that's legal or not. But anyway, um, we are um, also putting together a climate action plan for Anchorage. Of course, Anchorage isn't the state. Anchorage tends to be more Democrat than the rest of the state. And we're trying to say, what are we gonna do Different communities are putting solar panels on roofs. I mean, different neighborhoods. So we're, we're trying all angles at the same time. We're having teach-ins. We're trying to get people in. But it's really, really hard to change without a crisis. And, and that's what Jeremy was saying, too. People don't change unless there's a, a real crisis that really happens to them. Right, right. So, so you've been with living, though, in this place, what, 1984, right? You bought your, your place on the mountainside? Oh, or no, here? that's when it was built. That was it was, it was built in the 80s, yeah. Um, and it got a national award. So, yeah, th those were the days, you know, when people were thinking about the environment. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we bought it in 95 and it recycles all its water and waste. The, it now is part of the city of Anchorage. It got sucked up. And so any changes we wanted to do had to be um, granted with a permit. And they weren't giving us any permits to change anything or to fix our shower or anything unless we could um, put in a well and a septic. So we've had to conform and we now have a well and a septic just like everybody else. We continue to collect all our rainwater off the roof and use it as we can. And we can recycle our gray water. We're still composting our toilet, even though we have a flush toilet that we're not, we're not using really. We're mm -hmm. still using our composting toilet, but um, yeah. How much, what percentage would you say self-sufficient you are now? And what, as, as to say, the temperature goes up, the range change, uh, how confident are you in, with the systems that you have you could maintain um, self-sufficiency? Are you asking Cindy that? Oh, Cindy, yeah. 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 Uh-oh, my internet connection is unstable. Can you hear me? Yeah, it, it froze there yep. for a second. It's kind of oh, freezing okay. off and on. All right, no, I think we're probably um, vulnerable in that we need electric pumps to run the pumps around. But other than pumps, if we put in solar panels, we'd probably be okay. It's just, I can't get my mind around batteries. So once you have batteries, then you're, that's, and, and the little, the minerals that it takes some poor Chinese child. Yeah, we're losing you. Uh there okay well jeremy yeah so uh, are you what are your plans now for um the coming future are you gonna stay in florida or back to alaska or? um well i've got some research projects uh, that i proposed on and one of them was approved so i'm collecting soil samples as i drive back to alaska and uh, work on my homestead there so it, it'll probably take uh, a month or so to head back that way to uh, be with family and work on some project, finish up some loose ends up there. But um, in the next five to 10 years, um, going back to, you know, what are the proposed, what are proposed solutions to solve this? Because it's a, a social issue, economic and um, policy, you know, there's no one, one, uh, tier solution that's going to fix everything so like cindy was saying we definitely have to uh, look at it from uh, multiple perspectives and approaches and tactics um so my own personal ones like i was saying is building up the skills uh that i need in order to be 100 percent self-sufficient while at the same time working on the community aspect and uh, networking with other folks that have skills that i might not personally have or they may be better at and appreciating that aspect of community coming together because that's how it's going to work when times get tough. We're going to realize as individuals, we can't do this. And so I'm this year focused on community. That's the other reason why I'm um, helping family first 
um, approaching their project saying, how can I help you? Uh, and then I'll go back later on once they're set to look at my projects again. And that, those entail, like I was saying earlier, looking at uh, where I'm living. You know, Alaska might not be the most sustainable place to live in the future. If there's more people than um, Alaska can handle as far as, you know, moose and pr productivity in the garden, you know, but at the same time, a lot of people are going to leave that area and my family's already established there. So as far as my circle of influence is concerned, that is my home. That's where I have the most effect and the biggest tie to a community. And so I'm, I'm focused on developing that and, in, in, you know, long term. Mm -hmm. Um, relation to what's going on in the rest of the world, not going out and being an armchair politician and trying to fix everybody else's problems. Um, just focusing on what's around me and what I have the, the ability to change and to influence. And that starts with myself internally. I can't blame anybody else for what's going on in this world if I can't get my own in order. Right. Right. So that's, that's what I have in, in store. Mm -hmm. So it sounds to me like the, the independent homestead uh, that Alaska is kind of known for is going to kind of probably out of necessity, one of the choices, I guess, is to convert back to the village or the community living, which it was, which is what it was, I would assume. Right. And it's super important when you're raising children, uh, when you have elderly, if you want uh, those people that have quality of life in your community, you have to take care of them and in hard times it's it's difficult to do that and so preparing yourself and setting up your life to take care of those that are going to take care of you or who took care of you when you were young that's the village aspect and in my own personal opinion is what we've lost in that pursuit of individu individual individuality and success because in america the u.s it feels like success is uh very much a, a personal thing. And I have always um, looked at a lot of other cultures and admire them for saying success is family and the village. And, you know, they have all of those um, connections to um, make things happen when they get sick or, you know, to, to in South America, I was down there um, last year, when a, a man and a woman reached the age to get married, their whole family on both sides came together and built them this mud ha hu house hut. It was a house to them, a hut to us, but it was like, wow, you know, they have nothing, but there's a bunch of people out there, 30, 40 people making bricks out of mud and baking them in the clay and they're getting a house out of it, you know, and it's just, you don't need money. And once people realize that they, you start looking at, you know, what else can we do in order to, to live our life the way we want to live it? Cause you don't need anything to be happy really. I don't. At least that's what I'm finding. <laughs> the, the lower my standards go, the more I appreciate yeah. the, those things that are up here. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. I'll just comment on that. And then I get back to Cindy here, though, is that what I am finding, and this comes from other classes, is that we actually are lowering our standards of expectation, but we're raising the standards for ourselves as being, yeah, exactly. we expect much more of ourselves than we do from other people or the system. But our so expectation true. of those systems is what's going down. You know, exactly. the quality I'm getting from anything I buy from certain areas, certain stores, that's going down. The things that I make for myself and the systems that I create for myself, my standards are, are very, very high. Uh, and very the quality, well and as you would probably agree, the quality of our food, the quality of our lifestyle is actually better yep. relative to yep. health and relative to, you know, self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Cindy, what's, what's, uh, what are your plans there, do you think, going forward? Well, I... I uh, Jeremiah alluded to this too. We we're kind of on the same wavelength, I think, today, and that is that um, permaculture is all about earth care, people care, and share the excess. And we just have to be nailing that over and over again. I think Kurt and I, our biggest thing is people care. There's the people coming in from the villages, this, the, the generational trauma that was created with the boarding schools, all the alcoholism, drugs, all through Alaska. Alaska has the highest suicide rate. Um, a lot of that needs to come together as well as the same time as the climate part is happening. So, and just keeping our traditions of sharing the excess, that's, that's what has to happen. 
We need to be continuing to share our $10,000, our 10,000 year tradition of sharing it needs to happen. We need to be moving more together. Um, Western culture still says, yeah, I'm going to go cut out my own piece of the tundra and make my own farm, but I should get my friend to get on video. He tried it for three years. He about killed himself. Yeah, it's tough. Can't do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's the main thing that Kurt and I are going to focus on. Teaching people. We now are trying to build um, straw clay and cordwood buildings, natural buildings, so we don't have to haul in all this material to build buildings. And I talked to some uh, Inupiat people about that, and they said, are you white folks telling me that now I have to go back and live in the bugs again? <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, they're, they're, the people that I've talked to about natural building are not excited, but um, we have to somehow curb our carbon, and mm. it has to involve people care. Right, right. Well, I appreciate your time today and, and uh, joining me. And by the way, this is a global earth repair, uh, global check-in. I'm Dan Halsey. I never did the intro. I'll do the intro. We'll put that in, edit it in, in the front here. But uh, Cindy Carnes and Jeremy Marsh really appreciate uh, you doing this and hope we can check with you again and, and do this more often. I don't get to talk to uh, some great people that I know like you all around the world that are basically have been set, they've been sitting still for long enough and developing their systems that they've developed an observation of these patterns, but also we've been getting some great insight uh, from people about their life, the changes that are coming uh, forward here, and also the adaptation that we might have. So uh, I really appreciate yeah. your time and, and well, joining us. thank you us. so much. You're welcome. And we'll be, we'll be playing this uh, May 4th at the conference and then it'll be on YouTube also. Awesome, can't wait to see it. Yeah. I can't wait to see it either. So you want another piece sent in, it said somehow? Well, if you would, what I'd like also, yeah, if you would, if you have any kind of presentation about uh, your lifestyle or about your place, uh, where well, you know, we're not doing like, you know, herb spirals right. or things like that. It's like anything specific and insightful that you might have mm -hmm. as a presentation about your okay. adapting and, and going uh, and about climate change or lifestyle or things that are going to help people as we go forward adapting to the climate change to avoid a tragedy. I do have a recommendation for that. Uh, a lot of people are talking about um, uh, the permafrost melting in Alaska and how it's affecting mm -hmm. indigenous cultures. One, one of the other main huge, huge things that I see coming is um, that, and it, this affects the entire world, um, the warming of the oceans and our salmon populations, a multi-billion dollar um, economic impact in Alaska, but also around the world. We're one of the few remaining sources of that salmon. So when that does start to dwindle, or if anything, you know, tragic happens to it, um, there, that's going to be one of the other major, major aspects that we're going to be talking about it. And there's also already uh, a few coalitions that I'm going to reach out to that may have a presentation on that market and talking about the uh, preempt or the uh, things that they're putting in place to uh, deal with that or to even start thinking about it and get people aware of it. So you're talking about a direct loss of salmon or a huge reduction a loss, of salmon? Uh, any huge, well, we've, huge. we've continued to see uh, declining populations of specific species of salmon. We still have a strong sockeye run, but you know, it being one of the last major uh, pure uh, wild salmon done. stock. King runs What's are that? pretty much done. There's yeah. hardly any kings anymore. Good example. And, you know, yeah. if they say the pollock industry and the other larger global uh, demand for fish as it rises with the population and it, you know, continues to e erode away our stocks as a state, as one of the largest producers of the world in that industry, you know, we're going to be seeing the biggest impact from that alone. And that's, to me, going to be bigger than what we're seeing uh, as far as the um, uh, different villages being impacted by, you know, melting mm. of the permafrost and everything, because that has uh, the biggest economic impact, immediate economic mm -hmm. impact. Plus uh, the bears, the the eagles, and the raptors yeah. and everything else yeah. is dependent on right. that. Yep. So I just yeah. got to say Alaska wild salmon is, you know, the primo salmon. Everybody goes for it. And when it get, becomes rare, the price is going to skyrocket and you, we're going to have all kinds of poachers. We probably already have illegal fisheries going on, but... 
we're going to have all kinds of people going up there to get what's left of it. What's and left. it's going to be a rapid decline. So mm -hmm. in that, um, yeah, yep. that's that, that whole economic thing. I'm not really even thinking about that. I'm thinking about the people that yeah. are um, surviving on it now, but you're exactly right. Cause that's economic. Um, I and also wanted to say that we never even talked about ocean acidification. And that's right. And that's oh, why I wanted to bring it up. It's, yeah. it's a big thing. It's a, it, I've seen fisheries all over the world and they're all complaining that it's not what it used to be. So that right there tells you it's, it's going to continue to, you know, decline if we're going at the rate we're going now. Yeah, and then you don't have anything to eat anymore. All those little exactly. shellfish that they were eating, they're all gone. Mm -hmm. And right. what happens with the warming is, you know, we see these uh, microscopic phytoplankton, algae, all these blooms in the ocean they're the ones that are going to start consuming all of this excess carbon. And so we're going to see these huge, massive clouds of oxygen eating algae blooms. And if they're not already, you know, um, out there starting up um, or in, on the incline. That's um, a, it's, like last summer, there was a huge one off of Wainwright, off, yeah. off the Arctic Ocean. We would never had algae blooms in the Arctic yeah. Ocean before. Really? Yeah, and wow. red, tide, red tide down here because of the nitrates going into the Gulf yeah. of Mexico. Mm -hmm. Up in Alaska, they were even seeing uh, red tide down the uh, southeast. southeast. So I mean, yeah. you start seeing more, uh, you know, depletion of coral reefs and the fisheries are, sure. are in steady decline. And I don't think people bring that up enough because we're so reliant on that. Right. So, mm -hmm. so every time and there's so a change in, you know, the pH or there's a slight change in temperature, there's some ecosystem change, but there's also some species that's going to win and some that's going to lose. Right. And it really throws everything out of balance and you have these little critical points and that's where the feedback loop starts is all you have to do is get the, this small yeah. little point and then it just goes uh, out of control as if we had any control. Yeah. As if all. we didn't control, right? exactly. Well, let's, let's we should, uh, and I would like to like in those, we should touch on that more in, in depth in another call. I would really appreciate doing that. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. For okay. Sure. Um, I also want to tell both of you that Allie Barker was on the cover of Edible Alaska this month. So go check out the Edible Alaska website and you can see her farm. Good and for all her. That. Oh, that's and great. Her. She's great. Yeah. She's awesome. I like Allie. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you both very much, Cindy Carnes and uh, Jeremy Marsh. We'll keep in touch. Honored to be time. on the show. Thank all you right. very much. Take Thanks. care. Bye-bye.